in this video will cover two topics. The first is the ideal strength of solids. The second is dislocation types we can observe in crystalline materials. Since about 100 years ago, scientists have been thinking about what is the ideal strength of a material. This is the highest possible strength of the material. The first person who tackled the problem is Frankel back in 1926. He argues to plastically deform a material, you need to glide one atomic layer against another atomic layer. Assuming the equilibrium distance from one position to another is B, and the two atomic layers they are A units away from each other, then the shear stress that is required to perform such an action is described as GB over 2 pi A multiplied by sine 2 pi X over B, where G is the shear modulus of the material, X is the shear translation. It is a sinusoidal equation, so the maximum shear stress you need to glide the, uh, the two atomic planes is when X is equal to half B. In this case, the sine part of this equation is equal to 1, and the ideal strength of the material is GB over 2 pi A. In crystalline materials, A and B are comparable, so the ideal shear strength can be approximated as G over 2 pi. However, this is not what people have observed experimentally. The experimentally measured shear strength is usually a very small fraction of the ideal shear strength. Therefore, when you plastically deform a material, it is not simply one atomic plane gliding on another atomic plane. We need something called dislocations to facilitate the deformation. This cartoon is a really nice analogy, showing Orovan pulling on a carpet. Orovan is a scientist who had substantial contribution to dislocation theory. Let's think about two scenarios. In the first scenario, you are pulling on the carpet. This is not easy, and this process is similar to that of gliding one atomic plane on another. In the second scenario, you can create a kink in the carpet and push the kink. The force that is required to push the kink to move the carpet is much less than pulling the entire carpet. This is an analogy of gliding a dislocation. After understanding why we need dislocations in the material for plastic deformation, let's look at what types of dislocations can exist in a crystalline material. There are three types of dislocations, edge dislocations, screw dislocations, and the mixed dislocations. Let's look at the edge dislocation first. In the example shown here, the dislocation line goes into the page. Next, we'll introduce a very important concept, Burgess vector. In order to find out the Burgess vector of the dislocation, we need to construct the Burgess circuit. Away from the dislocation core, we can draw a line and let's count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 horizontally. Then we go down by 1, 2, 3, 4. To continue, draw a horizontal line counting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and another line going up by 1, 2, 3, 4. Now you see the Burgess circuit has a gap. To complete the circuit, you need an additional vector, and this is called the Burgess vector. Notice the Burgess vector is perpendicular to the dislocation line direction. Also, near the dislocation core, you can see lattice bending. This tells us there is elastic strain stored near the dislocation core. Lastly, if you look at the gliding of the dislocation, the dislocation line will glide in this way. So, the gliding direction is parallel to the Burgess vector. The second type of dislocation is called screw dislocation. In the figure on the left, it shows a perfect crystal. The one on the right shows a screw dislocation. And here is the dislocation line direction. You can see the Burgess vector in the screw dislocation is parallel to the dislocation line direction. Again, you see the lattice bending near the dislocation core that tells us there's elastic strain stored near the dislocation core. When the dislocation line moves, it's moving up and down, basically zipping or unzipping that crystal. So the dislocation line moving direction is perpendicular to the Burgess vector.
combining both the screw and the edge characters in the dislocation, you will have a mixed dislocation. In this example, you see here has the edge component, and here has the screw component. Thus, it is a mixed dislocation. If you see a dislocation that is curved, then 100% you're sure it is a mixed dislocation. After talking about the types of dislocations, let's look at the basic properties of dislocations. First, dislocations must be closed loops or terminate at interfaces. You cannot have a dislocation line with both ends terminating in the crystal. Second, if there are multiple dislocations meeting at a point, this point is called a node. The sum of the Bergs vector is zero. In the example shown below, b1 plus b2 plus b3 will be equal to zero. Third, in many cases, you need to estimate the dislocation density. Dislocation density is calculated by using dislocation length divided by the volume. A common unit for dislocation density is 1 over micron square. This is a fun slide. Dislocations they do not only exist at the atomic level, they are kind of everywhere. You can see edge dislocations in cactus and in corn. You can also see the screw dislocation on the brick wall. In the next video, we'll have a closer look at how the atoms arrange near the dislocation core and look at the elastic properties of dislocations.